Good morning. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And so in the Lord's Prayer, we've got up to the next part, which is, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Oh dear, and it was going so well. Certainly, we're challenged and stirred by what we have considered in the prayer so far. It's not a bland prayer, and we would not expect that coming as it does from the lips of Jesus. But these lines do raise the stakes. They suddenly become very personal and search our hearts. The first line, forgive us our sins, at first reading feels comforting. To be able to come to someone we can trust absolutely and spill out our deepest fears about ourselves and our behaviour and be certain that we will find understanding and forgiveness is a source of comfort and relief for us. Psalm 103 gives a sense of what it means to be wrapped in God's love with our sins or transgressions, the things we've done wrong or where we have failed to do the right thing placed as far away from us, as far as the east is from the west. The second line, we forgive others our sins, is a lot more challenging, but does feel possible and feels like the right thing to do. Is it something that we can strive towards? So where's the difficulty? Well, it lies in one little word that I've missed out, but is probably the most important word in this sentence. And that word is as. When we join them together, we see that we are to forgive others as or in the same way that God forgives us. The parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew chapter 18 does not come across as one of Jesus's gentle, loving parables. But it does make clear that there is a link between God forgiving us and us forgiving others. With that, let's take a deep breath and see what is expected of us. The first thing that we are expected to do is to ask God for forgiveness. We have seen already that it isn't just the words that are important, but also the order of them. Jesus deliberately starts this section with us asking God for forgiveness. But why do we have to ask God for forgiveness every day and whenever we pray? Surely the basis of our Christian faith is that we turn to God and that he forgives us. Jesus went to the cross for that very reason. The parable of the unforgiving servant starts with a king who is owed an enormous debt, 10,000 talents, by one of his servants. This was around 60 million denarii, and a worker at the time earned one denarius a day. So the servant would have had to have worked for over 164,000 years to be able to repay it. And that doesn't allow for them having to eat, clothe and house themselves and their family. You're welcome to do the maths. The point is that the debt was incalculable and could not be repaid. There were only two options. The king could sell the servant and his family into slavery or he could cancel the debt. He does the latter. We are that servant. God has seen us at our worst and still loves us. He knows everything we have ever thought or done and yet still loves us. It is beyond our capacity to repay God for what we owe him. But the psalmist says he does not treat us as our sins deserve because God is also that king. He wipes the slate clean. Having forgiven us so spectacularly and completely, what then does he expect of us? Well, he expects us to have fellowship with him, the opportunity to sit with him and eat and talk and listen. What he doesn't expect from us is perfection. We are still stained by the daily events of life, the irritations of our world which lead us to exchange angry words with friends make rash judgments on strangers, willfully misunderstand something, 
and so many other things which leave us feeling ashamed. So we still need a day-to-day -day cleansing, which we obtain when we confess our sins. This line restores fellowship with our Heavenly Father, the fellowship which is interrupted by that daily tarnishing of life, which affects us all. On the night before he died, Jesus washed the feet of all the disciples. Peter took exception to that. Jesus told him that if he could not wash his feet, then he would have no part of him. So Peter, impetuous as ever, demanded that Jesus wash all of him. Jesus patiently reminded Peter that if he has already bathed, then washing his feet would be sufficient. The whole body is clean, Jesus told Peter, but the feet were dirty from their walking in the world and so needed attention. That is this line of the Lord's Prayer in action. But when we pray this line, that greater forgiveness that God has shown us in cancelling that spectacular debt echoes in our thoughts and reminds us of God's constant and abundant mercy towards us. And it is important to hold that thought in our heads as it leads straight into the next line, as we forgive those who sin against us. Oh, to forgive the way that God has forgiven us. This line is not intended to be a problem line. It is intended to be an affirmation of the fullness of our life with God. The reason we can find it difficult is that we make the act of forgiveness into a legal action. We see that with the servant. The servant is owed a much smaller debt, but doesn't cancel it and follows through with his threats of imprisonment. Maybe things were tight at home, and that small as the amount was, he did need the money for his family. Maybe the debtor was a slippery character and had promised many times before that he would repay it, and this was just one lie too far. Or maybe the servant's reputation was on the line, and he thought that he had to make an example of this man as a warning to others. Obviously we aren't told, but it does seem astonishing that he cannot forgive, having just been forgiven so completely himself. And yet it is so easy for us to be that servant. I cannot forgive that person because they're not really sorry. I can't forgive them because what they've done is so awful that it would be against justice for me to do so. I can't forgive that person because they aren't even aware that they've wronged me and they need to understand that first. But there are no conditions here that give a loophole not to forgive. The fact is, forgiveness is a moral action, not a legal one. It takes minimal grace to forgive someone who is sorry. It takes maximum grace to forgive someone who is not sorry, or even aware of what they've done. And we're not in a court of law, we are in the kingdom of God, where grace operates. The unforgiving servant has tasted grace, but is stuck in the law. So it ends badly for him, grim indeed. But the parable is exactly that, a story, a warning. It is intended to show how the story should not end. The script in the Lord's Prayer is different and is intended to direct us as to how it should end. The prayer teaches us that if we are to be forgiven, then we truly can be forgivers. In experiencing forgiveness, we are then best able to forgive. Our forgiveness begins as a response to our being forgiven. It is not so much an act of generosity towards whoever has hurt us, as an act of gratitude towards our forgiving God. Forgiveness is neither easy nor cheap, but it does make us whole. In forgiving us, God is refusing to hold anything against us, refusing to let our sin have the last word in the way the world works. And in challenging us to forgive others, Jesus is not saying that the injustice we have suffered is inconsequential. He is not saying that justice when appropriate should not happen. But Jesus is refusing to let sin have the last word in our story. In challenging us to forgive, 
Jesus is inviting us to turn the world around, to throw a spanner in the eternal wheel of retribution and vengeance, not to silently suffer the hurt, lick our wounds, and lie in wait for the day when we shall be able to return the blow that was dealt to us. Instead, it is a challenge to turn things around, to be victors rather than victims. The world produces enough victims. We can forgive. The courage to forgive one another begins in the humility produced by the realisation that we have been forgiven. Forgiveness is a gift, a gift that is first offered to us, which we accept and then offer to others. Jesus' answer to Peter to forgive 70 times 7 was a comment that our forgiveness has no limits, just like God's. In our forgiving and being forgiven, we are made part of God's kingdom, a part of God's victory over the powers that would otherwise dominate our lives. It is a continuing fight, which is why we have to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, and why we need to pray it every single day. Amen.